So I want to talk a bit about modernizing uh, transport data and the work that we're doing with Open Transport Partnership. Um, this is actually work that's actually started at the World Bank and is a, is a collaboration with a bunch of uh, multilateral groups, thinking about kind of what the future of, of data is in the transport sector. And this actually fits really closely with the questions I think that are being asked here uh, this week about governance and the kind of ways that we think about uh, the way that data and kind of governance intersect in, in transport. I want to start out, you know, we're, we talk a lot about transportation uh, technologies and kind of technology in general right now in the, in the consumer world as being platforms, kind of being these technology platforms. And I want to start out with the kind of premise that cities are actually the first platform technology and that for, you know, quite a long time, for, you know, thousands of years now, we've been innovating on kind of the development of technological infrastructure that we can kind of build society on top of. And that's really been physical infrastructure for, for most of this history. This is a, a picture of a cross section of a street in Berlin in the in 1890s, uh, you know, just showing the kind of just incredible amount of innovation that was occurring and kind of building the kind of physical infrastructure that makes a city possible. Uh, and there's everything from telecommunications and, and power and sanitation to transport and thinking about the kind of ways that we move people and, and goods around. You know, all of these are kind of uh, platforms that we built into cities to enable people to live in, in kind of close proximity with each other in a way that was efficient and kind of mi minimize the downsides. And really, cities were about kind of helping that reduce that friction and make that possible for people to actually live in, in coordination. And this technology played a really fundamental role in that. And this, this infrastructure you know, that we've been building, and this is particularly to in transportation, is really fundamentally about coordination. It's about coordinating how people share a confined space, how they maximize the benefit of that, how they minimize the downsides. Um, but we're in a moment right now where, where we're, I think this is quite clear to everyone here, that we're moving from primarily physical forms of coordination to informational coordination. And this is, a, this is just a screenshot of Waze and uh, in, in showing in LA kind of the way that we're, we're now kind of collaboratively understanding this and sharing information with each other as a way to utilize already existing physical infrastructure and physical spaces. So I've spent most of my career working on this in the kind of open data world, uh, thinking about how we actually make that data that drives informational coordination uh, available to people. And I think that one of the things, really interesting parts of the story that we should go back to and understand is that you know, back in you know, 2007, this is a group of folks that got together uh, kind of under the title of the Open Government Working Group to kind of sit down and define what does it mean to kind of take this idea of the city as a platform or kind of a community as a platform, uh, you know, set of technologies that we're all building on top of and bring that into the, the world that's being created by the internet. And, and what they did is they created a set of uh, principles that kind of guided the, what we've called the open data movement or the open government data uh, movement for the last decade. Uh, and these principles you know, define the way that we think about this informational layer as being available to people to build on top of and to build communities that, that work you know, to kind of maximize the benefits and kind of ensure that people are brought into this, this digital world. And I don't think there's any sector that's benefited more than this, more from this than transport. I've spent most of the last 10 years kind of working in that world on the transport side. And there's just incredible examples of how this has changed the lives of literally billions of people. Uh, one of the ones that I've worked on quite a bit is this idea about GTFS, or so the General Transit Speed Specification, which lets people around the world know about public transit. There's also data in OpenStreetMap that's you know, millions of people collaborating to build a, a, just an incredibly rich uh, map of the physical world and the kind of way that city infrastructure uh, is, is managed. This is a picture of Leipzig from the OpenStreetMap that's built by, entirely by volunteer kind of collaborative effort. So there's really just a tremendous amount of data and kind of potential that's come out of this open, open data movement. Uh, but the thing I want to bring up here and kind of talk about going forward in the work that we're doing is that after a decade of trying to realize this potential, we're really at a moment, we're at a crossroads moment in this, in thinking about this. And I want to talk a little bit about why, um, what, what's actually been occurring over this period of time that, that maybe caught us, many of us by surprise or, or kind of slowly creeped up on us. First of all, it's worth recognizing that there are two kinds of open data. Uh, and that there's top-down data. This is a, a kind of the data like GTFS, things that government produces and shares with us to kind of understand how, how the world works uh, physically, the kind of services that, that we provide as, as civil society, and the data that's about those services. There's also bottom-up data uh, that's produced by citizens. And this is the data like OpenStreetMap, which is entirely a collaborative representation uh, that people got together on their own and figured out ways to map the world and, and make sense of it and share that information with each other. The open, da the open data movement uh, and the, particularly the world, you know, open government uh, world that relates to open data, I think we really underestimated the power of bottom-up data. I think that a lot of the work that um, I've been involved in and many of the folks I think in, in this community and the transport sector have been involved in focused on top-down. 
And I think we, what really has been amazing, and it's actually a really extraordinary uh, outcome, is the, the real power of the bottom up that's occurred as a result of uh, digital connected you know, kind of citizens with mobile phones and, and tremendous ability to kind of aggregate our understanding of the world in real time. We've really seen the, the true revolutions in the transport sector and many of the things that are coming forward uh, out of the technology in general is coming from the bottom up side of this. And this is in many ways a surprise. The other thing that I think that has been interesting in the kind of open government world is not really appreciating the role of private sector innovators in, in driving this. And I think that uh, nowhere has this been more true in the kind of like what's happened the last 10 years around uh, the smart cities movement and the kind of thinking about the role that private sector has to contribute and wants to contribute to uh, shaping the kind of in digital infrastructure, technical infrastructure that underpins uh, civil society. There's just a tremendous amount of work that's gone on to try to bring work from the private sector in and help government re really reimagine re itself. But as part of this, one of the things that's occurred, and this is something I think is, is not well understood by many of the people I've worked with in the public sector, is a shift from private sector innovators from vendors and kind of people who are selling services to government to enable public sector do its work, to a vertical integrator who's working really from a consumer-oriented perspective and building platforms that consumers are benefiting from that provide the services that actually in some ways compete with what government was doing before. And we see this tension starting to occur with Uber. This is something that's played out you know, quite a bit in the US and, and in many other parts of the world where there's this kind of question about really who's in control of this, this future that's emerging. And this is something that we're, that we're, you know, what's occurring in this is we're realizing the potential of bottom-up data but we're increasingly doing it through closed platforms that are not really part of the kind of traditional discourse around, around the public, uh, public realm. And one of the other things that's happened in this is, is this, this has happened is that data is actually becoming increasingly a competitive advantage rather than an open platform we can, we can build on top of. And many of the companies that are doing this from a kind of a vertical integration standpoint or doing it entirely through private enterprise are, are seeing the data that they collect, the kind of bottom up data they collect is actually a barrier to entry for their competitors. So the question we're asking right now, and this is where the work I'm, I'm doing with Open Transport Partnership is really looking at is, what does this mean? And what do we, what do, how do we think about this? And what it means is the street, kind of the transportation layers that we build in cities as open platforms going forward. If we've kind of realized this, the potential of this, but kind of you know, have some open questions now about how this actually will play out in the kind of intersection around public and private uh, control and the way that we think about the governance of these systems. So what we've realized is that we need new ways of thinking about data. The kind of traditional definitions, the ones that we came up with in 2007 around the kind of original framing of the open data movement weren't really quite complete solutions to this problem. We need to step back and we need to think about what are, what's a more complete set of these, of these options look like or these kind of ways of thinking about data look like. There's two challenges that are, are really quite critical that I don't think we've fully incorporated into this, especially not in the open data conversation. And the first one of these is privacy. Uh, the reality is that you know, the bottom-up data that we're collecting is just enormously, uh, enormous potential, but it's also really at odds with the idea of the kind of openness that we kind of embedded into the kind of open data movement. And the reason why is that it's about us as individuals. And this is a, a map of, of my life in, in D.C., Washington, D.C., where I live. This is a data that's collected just passively uh, as, a, as a user of Google Maps. My phone tracks my movement over the course of the day. Not only tracks my movement, it tracks where I went to and what I was doing there. It knows I went to the gym. It knows I went to the World Bank for a meeting. It knows that I rode my bicycle in the morning. It knows that I, I took the train home in the evening. Uh, so not only the activities, but the modes and the kind of times of this. And this is, this is data that's just passively collected uh, as part of just having the phone in my pocket um, and, and, and using Google Maps. On one hand, this is enormously just powerful data. This is completely transforms the way we think about transportation planning, the way we think about operational questions in the kind of transport world. But it also brings up enormous questions about sharing this data. This is data that is beneficial to everyone to understand and aggregate and to understand how to use. It's incredibly sensitive for me personally for this to become uh, part, of an open, uh, you know, part of an open data kind of conversation. How do we make that jump? So addressing the kind of privacy concerns, the tension between me as an individual contributor to this understanding and, and me as a private citizen. The second is really about accountability, uh, and it's about the fact that we're now creating this data through private platforms and through consumer services where companies are, are generating this data as part of their business. And increasingly, that, that generation, that process of collecting and generating data is at odds with some of the questions we're asking from a governance side. And again, we've, we've seen examples of this come up, uh, and the, you know, I'm going to use Uber again, and I actually don't want to you know, give the, you know, the, exa the kind of sense that I'm, I'm doing this beat up on Uber, actually. I think it's actually a really interesting uh, example of that's happened in the last several months we've kind of got to watch what Uber's encountered as, as it's gone through these questions about governance and data. 
And, and actually, this is not a surprise at all. Uh, this is something that you know, other industries, that not just transport, uh, other industries that are more mature and kind of thinking about data, have been dealing with for decades. If you look at the consumer, consumer finance world, uh, you know, there's just a long history of understanding that you've got entities that are producing data about the industry that also play a role from a regulatory standpoint and the, how, you, how you manage that kind of intersection between governance and the kind of uh, idea of you know, the data as a producer and the data as something that is an input to a regulatory process is incredibly complicated and we have to come up with more thoughtful ways to do it. Transport sector is just very early in that process. Uber is very early in that process as a company and we kind of see this collision that's occurred over the last you know, couple of years as we've tried to work that out. The question is, what do we do in response to that? And where do we go back to thinking about what's, what our options are? And I, I want to return to this idea of the kind of, uh, the kind of city as a piece of infrastructure and the kind of ideas of the way we built technology in cities around the concept of utilities. I think that there's actually a, a, a long history of kind of thinking about how we build technical infrastructure and kind of platforms to, to, you know, that are you know, tr really critical to everyone to have access to, but also quite complex to operate and involve many different public and private actors in actually running them. And we've been doing this for a long time already and, and other layers of technology. They've just been primarily physical. The question now is, can we bring some of that thinking about the way we've thought about, you know, kind of the, the way we manage physical infrastructure, technical infrastructure, like what we see in this, you know, kind of 1890s version of incredibly high-tech things around transport and sanitation and power, and bring that to where we are today with the kind of data layers that we're now increasingly critical to operating modern transport systems. So the question is, are there ways that we can start to think about building data utilities, or in this case, transport data utilities, that actually allow us to integrate the public and private in a way that addresses some of these questions about privacy, addresses some of these questions about accountability. And this is actually the work that we're, we're doing with the Open Transport Partnership, uh, is thinking about that intersection between the public and private and how we build a, a hybrid space where this, this can happen. And this is actually, you know, as I mentioned, this began at the World Bank. It's been something that's been being explored with colleagues there for, for you know, a number of years and kind of thinking about the way that, that private data or sensitive, you know, highly sensitive data from private industry can be brought to bear. It's actually expanded uh, working with NACTO and the World Resource Institute. This week, we're also excited to have uh, ITF involved as a, as a formal member in this work going forward to think about how we can actually start to, to, to navigate these at a global scale in, in many different geographies. And the work that we're we're doing really fundamentally focuses on public-private uh, partnerships and kind of thinking about the kind of transparency of those public-private partnerships around data. And what we're creating is tools, you know, data standards, and then really critically uh, infrastructure to help anonymize and aggregate and make that data relevant to different, different consumers. And what we actually what we think is really quite innovative about this is, is the, the sense that there's a third party involved, that we're not actually just relying on the, the producer of the data to, to make the data available in a form that's beneficial to the downstream users, but, but there's actually a, a negotiation that has to occur in between the you know, different stakeholders and the people producing this data. And we've actually started this around traffic data. This is the work that's been going on at the World Bank for a number of years, where we've actually been collecting real-time roadway speed data using GPS from uh, millions of vehicles and in increasingly uh, you know, wide geography of, of companies that are involved in actually producing this. These are private fleets that you know, have vehicles driving around cities, generating just a constant stream of information about where those vehicles are and the conditions they're encountering on the road. And we're building infrastructure that enables those companies to then make that data available in an anonymized aggregate form that doesn't undermine the, the, you know, the privacy concerns of their individual customers, doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't undermine really quite critically the business concerns that these companies have as competitors in a, in a really contentious market for transportation services, but still allows uh, public sector users and, and others to understand what they're encountering, how this data is actually, uh, is, can be used as an input to the transport planning. So we're already working on this in Southeast Asia where the project began with Grab. We've expanded it in Latin America. We're currently uh, exploring partnerships in, in other regions right now. So this is something that has been ramped up over the last year and a half now. And, and in the coming year, we'll, we expect to have you know, fairly significant coverage uh, uh, around the globe. One of the things we've realized in doing this, and we've started to build out the open transport partnership that's actually incubating this, is that cities actually need data infrastructure to manage a whole new set of questions, not just traffic, but the way that we are increasingly uh, changing the way we use streets. They actually need data infrastructure to support this sort of, uh, this sort of um, intersection about streets. And so what we're, we're imagining our work now, kind of looking ahead beyond traffic, we're thinking about this in a more holistic way. How do we start to build a more comprehensive view of the street that allows these public and private entities to start to come together? And then we start really with street data and the kind of underlying infrastructure on the street. And what we've encountered as we work with the public sector is that they're increasingly trying to find ways to talk about the street in a, in a digital 
uh, a digital way that can connect a whole variety of stakeholders together. This is uh, everything from roadway pricing and the desire to communicate about you know, kind of tolling and congestion charges to dynamic regulations or quite commonly about parking and the kind of ways that we use the curb space in cities. They actually need to talk about this, uh, this digital layer in a way to actually imagine the policy and governance structures that they have for the future of streets and that we actually need to develop this sort of language uh, to enable those sort of conversations to happen between public and private uh, you know, kind of regulators and users of the street space. It turns out that the, the infrastructure that we built for the open traffic project that kind of described the street was a, was a useful starting point for that. And one of the things we're stepping back to look at now is are there ways we can turn that, that description of the street, that kind of underlying um, digital representation into something that we can start to use to, to bring different public and private data sources together around a common, uh, a common understanding or a common description of what that street is and, and the way it's actually being used. The second level of this, and this is something that we're hoping to get into probably in the next year, this is a, a much more complex thing from a, from a privacy standpoint, is thinking not just about the street, but the actual transport demand and trip level data that's occurring uh, at kind of the operational layer of kind of how people are getting between places. And this is something that we see you know, kind of coming into this, um, into this, this overall uh, kind of utility environment and, and, and something we want to try to understand how we can help facilitate the sharing of this really sensitive level of layer of data that's actually quite critical to a whole bunch of different users. And then you know, finally, what, what comes out of this and then what actually gets shared is this kind of anonymized or aggregate view, not the actual individual inputs, but the, the kind of interpreted view of this and finding ways that we can present that in a way that's both transparent about how it's produced and uh, accessible to different, different users. So going forward, and this is our, our next, uh, our next uh, you know, several months of this, we're actually looking at the ways that we can start to use that description of, of the street to connect data about safety curb management, and increasingly multimodal information about different transport operators, both public and private, everything from mass transit to kind of shared mobility, how we can start to you know, use this common representation of the street to connect those data layers together. One of the things that we're recognizing in actually doing this work, and this is actually quite critical to how we operate, is that these sort of partnerships have to generate value for both the public and the private users. They can't just be something where you're coming in and compelling someone uh, to share something against their will, there's actually an opportunity to, to kind of look at this as, a, as a, something of mutual value and how we can think about the way that this sort of um, kind of shared space in the middle actually provides value to both sides. And we see examples in, in all the things we've talked about where there's potential for a more uh, coherent digital representation to encourage uh, private sector participation and actually generate value for the private sector participants and then at the same time create uh, clear frameworks for the public sector to, to build um, both planning and regulatory applications on top of. And the, the next, and I think the really critical final part of this is that we think that this is something that needs to be done in a way that's reusable. Uh, and the reason why is that these are increasingly kind of global digital spaces in Europe. I mean, there's already this you know, incredible conversation about kind of a single digital market that's occurring in Europe. Uh, you know, we look at that at a global scale. There's just an enormous need to actually have consistency from a consumer experience and from the perspective of the technology companies that are building these global platforms. And that we actually have a real, we really struggle on the government side right now to do that in a coherent way because the jurisdictional boundaries kind of prevent us from thinking about the digital work that, that cities do or governments do in a coherent way across those boundaries. And we think that this sort of partnership model allows us to kind of bring some portability into this and start to see more consistent implementations in more places that make that sort of vision of a, of a kind of coherent global digital uh, environment uh, more possible. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and happy to take questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, one quick question. Uh, yes. And there will be a microphone. Hi, yeah. I'm Christo Utelujenks from the Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communications. Um, I think that we're one of the first ones, if not the only ones at the moment, that are actually introducing new legislation related to data um, in our transport code project. So we're deregulating the market access quite heavily, but we're introducing uh, data regulation that will mandate everybody to open certain essential sets of data. Um, as well as to open the APIs for ticketing and payments for, with regards to single ticket or single trip to third parties. So I'd like to get your view, um, how or what role do you see for regulation 
with regards to data. I think what you're what you're describing there with the kind of the, the kind of exchanging uh, regulatory kind of existing regulatory frameworks for transparency or kind of openness on these digital platforms is exactly the right approach. So we see this this is a the kind of way to open up the, the market to innovators and actually give them clear signals about how they can come in and build technology and also make sure that market remains competitive. And in return, you, you give them clearer and potentially more flexible regulatory environments to build on top of and to have a signal that they're going to be able to operate in a, in a way that uh, is going to align with their business. That's actually the model I think that, that many governments you know, should be aspiring to. Uh, and, and it's really great that you all are out there on the Vanguard kind of pushing that because I think once that's demonstrated, uh, getting that to happen in more places and, and hopefully using consistent regulatory frameworks as well uh, will really you know, drive innovation in the industry, but also um, make sure that we end up with a stronger regulatory framework at the end. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, thank you again thank for you. your presentation.